In 2009, James O'Keefe hoodwinked a number of media outlets, activists, and politicians when he circulated recordings he had secretly made of employees working at Acorn. In the recordings, a disguised O'Keefe and his associate, Hannah Giles, got advice on everything from how to avoid paying a pimp to effectively trafficking children across the U.S.-Mexico border. What O'Keefe kept secret is that this footage was heavily edited and completely misrepresents the discussions he had. The Acorn workers, in many cases, were simply playing along with O'Keefe, and after the conversations alerted police to his activities, they weren't actively giving advice to criminals. Unfortunately, the doctored tapes were enough to convince conservative media outlets that Acorn was an agency committed to helping child traffickers and street pimps. The backlash was enough to scare the U.S. Census Bureau and the IRS into terminating their contracts with Acorn. By November of 2010, Acorn had to liquidate all of its assets and closed up for good. How did this deceptive footage convince so many people? And how did a phony journalist like O'Keefe seem so credible? The hidden camera tactic has long been a favorite of news outlets, and the O'Keefe tapes cashed in on that well-accepted strategy. By adopting the appearance of a genuine journalist, he was able to falsify a degree of credibility he never had and advance his particular conservative agenda. In this case, shutting down a non-profit that helped register voters in low- and moderate-income neighborhoods. Pretending to be a reporter covering a story is the perfect disguise for anyone who has an agenda to push. They simply need to look the part and engage what appears to be journalism, all the while leaving out facts, editing out context, and providing commentary that distorts reality to fit their worldview. And that brings us to Lauren Southern. Lauren Southern is a great example of someone creating narrative-driven pseudo-journalism that poisons our understanding of the world. In demonstrating how this type of pseudo-journalism works, I want to take a quick trip through Southern's career and the many tactics she's employed to push her particular narrative. That narrative being a mix of nationalism, white victimhood, and a desire to pull the Western world back to the 1950s. But to understand where Southern came from, we have to talk about the Toronto Sun. This daily newspaper launched in Toronto in 1971 and became a prominent voice for conservative news in the city. A tabloid both in its format and content, the Toronto Sun eventually spread to television. The cable news channel, The Sun News Network, launched in 2011. Its format was similar to Fox News, where it had reporting on during the day and commentary on in the evening. Sun News Network. Hard news. Straight talk. Coming soon. The channel did not do well. In three years, it lost $46.7 million Canadian, and by 2015, it went off the air. But the story of the conservative channel didn't end there. One of the personalities of the Sun News Network was a conservative commentator named Ezra Levant, the nationally known champion of free speech. For those who don't know, is a cheery fellow who is best known across Canada for his defense of free speech, most notably when he has to defend his own free speech when he's sued for libel, or when he sues newspapers for publishing the details of the horrible things he says. Three days after Sun News Network was shut down, Levant launched the YouTube channel The Rebel Media. The Rebel Media has been home to many odious faces, such as white genocide conspiracy theorist Faith Goldie, white genocide conspiracy theorist Gavin McInnes, and Great Replacement conspiracy theorist Lauren Southern. The Great Replacement is a code word for white genocide. For the record, all three of these people have left the rebel media, but it was the platform that propelled them into the limelight. So it's important to know to understand why we have these characters running around making the world a generally shittier place. Which brings us back to Lauren Southern, who was recruited by Levant when he noticed her at a conference he had organized. Levant was apparently impressed by the tough questions she was asking during a panel discussion, and later on he gave her a spot with the Rebel Media when it opened. In time, she became one of the YouTube channel's biggest stars, appearing in incredibly successful videos that, at first glance, have the appearance of journalism. Until you look a little closer. <laughs> Lauren 
Lauren Southern made her big internet debut in June of 2015 when she starred in a video titled Lauren Southern Clashes with Feminists at Slut Walk. Hello, it's Lauren Southern here with Rebel. And Filmed at a slut walk in Vancouver, British Columbia, the video features Southern breathlessly walking around asking questions of the participants, a tactic you often see used by real journalists on a wide number of different outlets. But much like the undercover O'Keefe tapes, copying the style of real journalists doesn't make what you're producing real journalism. For an example of real journalism, of the on-the-ground variety, here's a video covering the Umbrella Revolution protests of 2014 in Hong Kong, as reported by Phoebe Greenwood for The Guardian. This is Admiralty in Hong Kong. It is the heart of the Umbrella Movement, which is now on its seventh day. Tens of thousands of people have come to the streets here asking Beijing to allow them a greater democratic say in who leads them. It's an extraordinarily peaceful movement. It's perhaps the most polite bunch of protesters I've ever come across. But tonight is the deadline that they've given the chief executive, C.Y. Lung, to resign. No one here really thinks that he will, but no one here really knows what will happen if he doesn't. Now this is a great opening. Greenwood presents the video of the protesters and provides some context for why the protest is happening. You really feel like you've just learned something about the politics of Hong Kong and the people who live there. And all of that's just in the opener. Now let's compare this to Lauren Southern's supposed report on the 2015 Vancouver slut walk. Hello, it's Lauren Southern here with Rebel, and I just got in a huge confrontation with the slut walk, which we are following right now. Essentially, I held a sign that said, we are not living in a rape culture in the West, which we are not. It is intellectually dishonest to think that we are living in a rape culture. Rapes do happen, but the major or the minority, the vast minority of men and women are rapists. And when we do find out they're rapists, they go to prison, they are punished. Whereas in the third world countries and other places, men can get away with rape there. And it's insane to focus on this one issue and say that we are living in a rape culture. Rapists don't get high fives. We don't have the government funding rapists. Even men get fired from their jobs just for making rape jokes not even raping. So to say we live in a rape culture is quite frankly ridiculous. All right, let's go follow the walk. So there's a difference here. Southern immediately begins talking about herself and how her counter-protest wasn't warmly met. Southern also makes no effort to explain why the slut walk is happening or what the stated goals of the organizers are, the bare minimum when introducing the subject. She instead launches into a response about how wrong they are. A reporter not believing the claims of protesters is fine, but they have to first present the claims of the protesters, expanding on what protesters mean when they say rape culture and addressing criticisms to that explanation is far more useful than responding to what the reporter imagines they mean. Back to the Greenwood example. I really like this little snippet. Ah, oh, you're recycling. We don't think violence can help us any, uh, in any way. But recycling bottles can. Um, sort of. Now this question seems almost superfluous, but what it's subtly doing is presenting the innocence and perhaps naivete of the protesters. It could be interpreted as a subtextual criticism in expecting the notoriously anti-democratic Chinese federal government to respect the demands of the citizens of Hong Kong. But it also shows the importance of hope in a protest movement and the earnestness of the people involved. It's a simple question and a simple response, but it tells you quite a bit about the people there. Now contrast this with the segment in the Rebel Media clip. Well, how do you believe your outfit is going to stop perpetuating rape culture? Oh it's my body, it's my choice. I can wear what I want. And it should, this is exemplifying how it's a crime scene. Like wearing the caution tape that they would normally put around a physical crime scene with when it's not re regarding a person, but regarding me, it's regarding people. It's not considered a crime scene. That's f***ed up. It should be. It's a violation of a person's rights. So is this stopping rapes? Now this exchange was generally a train wreck and it ended with a terrible loaded question. For those who aren't aware of what a loaded question is, it's one that often includes an unfair assumption. A popular example is if you ask someone, when did you stop beating your wife? The assumption in the question is that the person being asked abuses their wife. Asking someone, is your outfit stopping rapes, includes the assumption someone is dressing up to change the action of rapists. That's not why this woman is dressed up. She'll tell you why she dressed up, 
In fact, she did right before you asked that question. It's my body, it's my choice. I can wear what I want. And it should, this is exemplifying how it's a crime scene. If someone believes a rape culture is failing victims of rape and sexual assault and providing cover for abusers and rapists, generating conversation would be a good way to address that problem. This is a conversation Southern could have actually engaged in, but she wasn't listening. She was more interested in asking a question that made her subject look silly. She didn't attend this protest to report on the slut walk. She came to push an agenda. But I want to highlight this delicious little moment that happens immediately afterwards when another member of the slut walk confronts Southern with some heavy facts. I'm going to play the whole exchange because it's just great. Any stats to back up anything that you've said this afternoon? Absolutely. You said that rapists go to jail. Can you give me a stat to back that up based on the number of rapes that are reported? the number of rapes that get taken to the cops, the number of rapes that get prosecuted. Could you give me some stats to back up your pseudo-reporting here? Well, first of all, uh, out of the amount of rapes that happen, out of 100,000 people, 1.7 uh, of Canadians actually, even just that's just reporting rapes. So Yeah, you know that less than 10% of rapes are actually reported. Okay, where's that? To the cops. From? Where's that? It's from all of the women's organizations. You can look it up online. You can find it through the socialized organizations that study rape. I participate with an organization that works as a rape crisis center. We base that on the number of calls. The police know based on the unofficial reports, the third party reporting, and the direct reports. This is not a secret that about 10% of rapes are reported. So, how do you know 10% of rapes are reported if the others aren't? Because those people call the women's centers, they ask for help, they seek medical attention. So they are reported. And this segment ends with a response that's a bit of a gotcha that really just proves Southern isn't really engaging with what the person is saying. It basically evaded all of that useful information the woman in sunglasses gave. Look at the first thing she says. Less than 10% of rapes are actually reported. Okay, where's that? To the cops. From? And then she goes on to mention all the other avenues in which rape is reported. Southern's response is... So they are reported. The to police part is the crucial difference here. A rape can't be prosecuted unless it's reported to the police. This woman is giving you evidence and a clear claim as to why police aren't hearing about the vast majority of rapes out there. Southern is either refusing to engage with the person she's interviewing or simply can't understand the point the woman in sunglasses is making. The last third of this video is dedicated to Southern's counter-protest and the response it generated. This is perhaps the most ridiculous part of the video. If you're truly there to report on something, how can you justify starting a second demonstration? You're no longer covering the story, you're part of the story. She ends the segment the same way it began, and nothing was learned. This video wasn't successfully reporting anything. Its only accomplishment was making Lauren Southern an internet star who advances a right-wing agenda. Take a look at how CBC News in Vancouver covered the story. And apologies for the quality, I got this off the channel of someone who doesn't know how to capture footage off a of TV. Dozens gathered in front of the Vancouver Art Gallery this afternoon. Their hope was to raise awareness of victim blaming around sexual assault. Many holding signs carrying messages about rape culture, a problem the group says is pervasive in our society. But things went sideways when one woman arrived with a message of her own. <laughs> So the story that was about the slut walk became a story about Lauren Southern, or as the CBC reported, one woman. I have to imagine this is something Southern either intended or something she takes pride in. After all, I got the poorly captured video from her YouTube channel. This pattern of dreadful on-the-ground pseudo-reporting continued through much of Southern's early career. She went to another slot walk in Edmonton, a third in Los Angeles, and no valuable reporting happens. She tries to capture protesters with poorly thought-out loaded questions, and she goes the extra mile to make sure we always know how poorly she's being treated. Our cameraman got shoved and pushed, our, my sign was ripped up, and I got a few mi middle fingers and got called a bitch. She always underscores how she feels afraid or frightened and that the people she disagrees with aren't just people she disagrees with. They're people who are, in some way, rude or physically dangerous. In other words, she's undermined their arguments by attacking their supposedly boorish characters. That said, there is some unintentional comedy here. This time they did know who I was and did not want to speak to me because of that, so they kept saying she's not a real reporter and don't talk to her. 
they were right. Someone who goes to a protest holds up a sign countering their message and then asks them loaded questions on camera to make them look silly isn't a reporter. There's someone with an agenda, someone who is desperately trying to make their political opponents look terrible. Before we move on, I want to provide a little bit of extra context here. The Slut Walks began in 2011 in Toronto as a response to the comments of Toronto Police Constable Michael Sanguinetti. He was addressing the issue of campus rape at a York University safety forum and said, I've been told I'm not supposed to say this. However, women should avoid dressing like sluts in order not to be victimized. The public was justifiably concerned that some officers were blaming the victims of sexual assault, and to voice their displeasure, the first slut walk was held in Toronto on April 3, 2011. These demonstrations quickly spread across Canada and through the United States. And there you go, you just learned more in the last 30 seconds about why the slut walk was happening than in a half hour's worth of Southern's pseudo-reporting. Also, I should give a little more credit to the woman in sunglasses because, as far as I know, she was the first one to ever refer to Lauren Southern's work as... Up your pseudo-reporting here? Had Southern added context to her videos, perhaps portraying the views of protesters in their own words rather than trying to trap them with loaded questions, Southern could have engaged with them honestly rather than trying to shape them into the straw man she was more comfortable tackling. By not sharing this information with her audience, Lauren Southern is presenting the protesters as a bunch of eccentric weirdos who have spontaneously decided we live in a rape culture. And that's the whole point of why the video was made in the first place. It's not to report on the event as it happens, but to distort the event to fit a right-wing narrative through a deceptive omission of facts. Southern moved away from covering protests in North America and took her ground circus to Europe for more pseudo-reporting. This time it was on something she was even less qualified to cover, the role of immigration in Europe. Southern's video about a demonstration in London campaigning to remain in the EU is titled Lauren Southern Attacked by Anti-Fascist Thugs in London. And to be honest, the title gives away everything that's wrong with this video. This isn't, as the description claims, Lauren Southern reporting for the rebel media. This is a video about Lauren Southern being attacked by supposed thugs. The video opens with text not about the demonstration, but about how Southern was in danger at the rally. The first images we see are of a camera pointed at the ground as the cameraman tries to orient himself. The rest of the video is a garbled mess, and it creates the impression that as soon as Southern showed up, things got messy and violent. Now this is a real problem if you're a journalist. How do you cover an event that includes a hostile element? If you step into an area and get immediately attacked, you might need to rethink your strategy and maybe find a go-between, or maybe you have to reach out to people indirectly to get their comments and opinions. But I did leave out an important fact there. Southern's crew didn't get attacked as soon as they entered the park. I know this for a fact because a few days later, the rebel media uploaded a video titled Full Length Version. Lower and Southern attacked by anti-fascists at London Brexit rally. There are two problems with this title, aside from the fact that it's schlocky clickbait. It isn't the full-length version of events because it's missing about a minute that was included in the first video. Also, it's not a Brexit rally. It was a rally against the Brexit movement. A small detail, but a sloppy mistake nonetheless. What's far more interesting is how this video opens, where we hear Southern describing her strategy for covering this rally. I literally don't even have to interview anyone. I can just stand here and it exposes what this group is like. That's a damning thing for a journalist to say. And more damning, Southern freely admits to not having interviewed a person the whole time she was there. I literally hadn't asked a single person for an interview. Not a single person I didn't talk to. Of course, she doesn't literally mean she hasn't talked to anyone because there's some footage of her talking to a guy who went up and took her hat and threw it in the garbage. He shouldn't have done that. But it's a far cry from the impression the first video gives you of Southern being attacked by anti-fascist thugs. As best I can tell from the second video, Southern's strategy on covering this rally was to stand around in a silly hat and make commentary about people while a cameraman filmed them. How can a supposed journalist justify describing the opinions and views of people around her without taking a moment to speak to them? Even if all she has are her loaded questions, that's better than not talking to someone who's only a few meters away from you. Aside from the clown who stole her hat and a few heated confrontations, it's difficult to see just how viciously Southern and her crew were actually attacked. And speaking genuinely, it's a shame that some demonstrators weren't on their best behavior. 
But this doesn't for a second let us Southern, whose reporting amounted to her standing around making fun of people and then acting surprised when people got upset. While the first video got nearly 2 million views, this longer version struggled to get even 70,000. The Rebel Media put out the edited one for a reason, and the headline gives it away. This wasn't honest reporting about the anti-Brexit protesters, this was done purely to frame them as dangerous and violent. The con of placing Lauren Southern in supposed danger is a pattern you'll see in many of her videos. There's always something that comes up in a video that scares her. As another example, in her video, Why Lauren Southern Needed Security to Walk Through Molenbeek, Belgium, she begins to panic when her film crew gets stares while they wander around at 11pm. The idea that a woman with a camera crew, speaking English, wandering around the street in the middle of the night, catching a few glances, doesn't seem particularly strange to me. You can feel things changing here now that it's like 11 p.m. You can feel the atmosphere change, eyes are on us, and security is telling us, like, not a good time to be here. Southern is clearly scared here. It makes me wonder why she just didn't pack it in while there was still daylight. Filming at night is always harder because you need to lug around heavy lighting equipment, and there aren't as many people around to speak to. It's almost as if she was trying to manufacture a situation where it would look like she's in danger. Let's listen to what she says when she starts discussing people who don't want their faces filmed. This could suggest a number of things, but before you have any reasonable ideas, like maybe people just don't want to appear on camera and they're going about their day, Southern is ready to speculate with something else, something less generous. This is filmed. They will get angry if they see the camera pointed in your direction. I don't know if that's because it's linked to maybe they are criminals. What a grossly irresponsible bit of commentary. Not wanting your face on camera doesn't make someone a criminal. Does Southern have any reason to believe there's a crime issue in Molenbeek? There's lots of uh, crime. Oh, a lot of crime. Yeah. Have you been robbed at all? Yeah, a lot of time. It's interesting. I talk to some people and they say, oh, there's no crime here. Of course, why not? But they don't uh, tell you the truth. They don't tell you the truth. Why not? Because maybe they're afraid of something. Listen to what Southern said before she asked the guy the question. It's interesting, I talk to some people and they say, oh, there's no crime here. Why did she decide to show this guy instead of the other people she mentions who say there's no crime? I'm not sure what gives this shopkeeper special knowledge of the situation, but wouldn't actual crime statistics help here? Here's a crazy idea. Let's actually look at those. According to the Brussels Institute for Statistics and Analysis, the total number of criminal offenses in Molenbeek actually went up in 2016 from 9,184 to 10,087. An increase of about 10% isn't really a crime wave, and of course it should be noted that it went back down in 2017 to 8,818, but this video is from 2016 so I'm not going to criticize it for not knowing the future. It's better to look at stats when they have a bit of context to them. So. Is Molenbeek especially dangerous as a neighborhood compared to other locations in Brussels? A look at the numbers suggests no, definitely not. With a population of 96,629 and a total number of crimes of 10,087, that works out to one crime per 9.6 citizens, or as it might be more commonly presented, 1,044 crimes per 10,000 people. Out of 19 neighborhoods in Brussels, Molenbeek is ranked 6th as most crimes per capita. So while it certainly isn't the safest place to be if you're in Brussels, there's no real evidence to suggest it's especially dangerous. Or more dangerous than, say, downtown Brussels, which saw 40,191 crimes in 2016, working out to roughly one crime per 4.4 citizens. Or 2,277 crimes per 10,000 people. So Molenbeek is safer, both proportionally and in total crime, than walking around the most populous area in Brussels. But why did Southern choose Molenbeek to begin with? This was part of a popular right-wing narrative at the time, that Molenbeek was a no-go zone in Brussels. A small number of residents who had lived in the area had committed terror attacks in Europe, most notably the 2015 attack in Paris that killed 130 people. This tragedy was used to demonize an entire neighborhood as the breeding ground for jihadis. Southern's contribution to this body of journalism was to walk around the neighborhood, talk to a few people, and then get very scared in the evening. Did we learn anything in her video? Did it provide any real context that might inform its audience? No, 
We just got another sample of a right-wing narrative designed to portray the Molenbeek neighborhood as dangerous without any substantive evidence. This is part of a larger anti-immigrant narrative, especially in anti-Muslim immigrants, that runs throughout right-wing media. You can see even lazier examples of this in Southern's video of her walking around a German town in 2016 titled Lauren Southern, I Thought I Was in Germany, Turkey? and her infamous 2017 video The Streets of Paris, both of which feature no interviews, no substantive research, and nothing more than someone walking around with a camera gawking at things, completely devoid of the speculative commentary found in the Germany video, Southern's Paris video in particular is a shining example of meaningless footage. Walking through Paris while gawking at the non-white people is not only not journalism, I'm struggling to describe it as anything other than racist. What precisely is someone supposed to get out of this? What's suggested in the video is that the face of Paris is changing, and the only real change that this video demonstrates is that there is a larger number of faces that are not white. There is literally nothing else you can get from this video. The description tries to provide cover by pointing out how no one was speaking French, but since the audio is a music track, we have to take Southern's word on that, and being bilingual hardly seems like a threat. The point she raises about French braids is mystifying. She could have also mentioned that no one was eating French toast. Videos such as this one emphasize how uninterested Lauren Southern is in reporting anything. She may be adopting the on-the-ground style you often see real journalists use, but instead of reporting anything, she's using it to smuggle right-wing talking points under the guise of journalism. The videos are designed to hide facts and distort realities so you'll buy into the worldview Southern is pushing. If you aren't familiar with right-wing talking points and narratives, videos pretending to be reporting like Lauren Southern's might seem compelling. Perhaps it may even seem like I'm projecting some right-wing stereotype on a woman who's honestly trying her best to report the facts. So to try to push back on that, I'm going to spend a bit of time looking at the ideology that drives Southern, which she happily illustrates for us in a short book published in 2016. It has the friendly title of Barbarians, How the Baby Boomers, Immigration, and Islam Screwed My Generation. It's a mere 82 pages long, with one of the biggest fonts and margins I've ever seen in such a tiny book. If you got rid of the citations, it would be slightly under 20,000 words. It's more like a long essay rather than a book, or maybe more accurately, a series of very short essays. Much of the book is populated with poorly sourced ideas, personal stories, and misreadings of history, art, and current affairs. I couldn't possibly detail everything she gets wrong, so I'll narrow it down to a few points that describe the narrative in Southern's mind. Towards the end, Southern offers four recommendations on how to save the West, and they are building border walls, an immigration policy based on merit and national origin, protecting free speech, and making people ashamed for needing welfare. The welfare one is just a really shitty thing to do, but I want to focus in on the national origin part of the second point. Although Southern claims not to be a racist, points like this make me pause. She also writes this. Immigration policy in the West simply fails to be remotely meritocratic. Immigrants are not led in to fill niches where our countries need help or to contribute in some way to society. It's even considered controversial in some circles to suggest that immigrants should be able to pull their own weight. All of this must be reversed. In the U.S., a good start would be repealing the Immigration Act of 1965 so that things like national origin can be factored into our calculus, and so that the limits of immigration from other Western countries can be removed. Everywhere else, the same sort of measures must be taken. The first thing you'll notice is that no sources are cited for any of this. While Southern does on occasion provide them, I counted 33 sources out of 48 footnotes provided. A cursory look at any Western nation's immigration process will show you the hoops a foreign national has to jump through in order to immigrate. It often involves interviews, providing documentation for skills, and other requirements that demonstrate merit. And Lauren Southern completely contradicts herself when she talks about how national origin should be factored into the calculation. She isn't even subtle about when she says limits on Western countries should be removed. She wants immigrants not coming from Western nations to be subject to greater selection pressures. If potential immigrants are being chosen based on their merit, 
what does their nationality have to do with that? If two doctors are applying to immigrate to Canada, one from Norway and the other from Pakistan, and all things about them otherwise are equal, why would Lauren Southern want to turn away the doctor from Pakistan? Or at least, why does that Pakistani doctor have to face restrictions that the Norwegian one wouldn't? I won't pretend I'm the first person to notice Lauren Southern saying something about immigration that, at the very least, sounds a little racist. For a more comprehensive look at this, check out Sean's excellent video, The Great Replacement Isn't Real, featuring Lauren Southern. Another popular theme in Southern's commentary is an appeal to a traditional lifestyle for women. That is to say, women should dedicate themselves to raising children in order to be happier. She often cites science she doesn't understand to produce opinion pieces that, instead of engaging with scientific evidence, distort it to fit a right-wing narrative. For a more thorough examination of this, I highly recommend another video by Sean titled, What Every Girl Needs to Hear, A Response to Lauren Southern. And after two shoutouts, I hope Sean sends me a nice check for putting him on the map like this. You're welcome. I really only highlight these two ideologies that exist in Lauren Southern's commentary to draw a connection to her pseudo-reporting. Everything she does is in service to this right-wing narrative, and how it harkens back to a golden age, specifically the 1950s as best I can narrow it down. Her book specifically takes aim at baby boomers who squandered the success of, as they're labeled in the media, the greatest generation. That is, the generation that fought the Nazis in World War II, which, I will admit, was pretty nice of them. Southern is trying to pull the West back to the time before the baby boomers supposedly ruined everything. In the interests of charity, I'm not certain the Jim Crow laws, rampant sexism, and rampant homophobia of the era enter into Lauren Southern's imagination when she says she and her fellow travelers are... We're longing for an age we've never lived in, and we're trying to recreate something that we never grew up being taught or understood. To be as generous as possible, Lauren Southern may not be a traditionalist hiding her secret racism and sexism, but in the best case scenario, she's a traditionalist who doesn't understand the racism and sexism that were implicit parts of the era she longs to be a part of. And her ignorance does not excuse the harm inherent in her message. And that message is important to understand when it's being pushed to you through the context of pseudo-journalism. Are you a racist? No, I'm not a racist, and the alt-right hates me. <laughs> they, they don't have any idea what they're talking about. These are just names that they throw around. Quite frankly, when I went to South Africa... Now that we've taken a look at Lauren Southern's early attempts at journalism and the ideology that her pseudo-reporting masks, I want to look at some of the more advanced techniques she's recently employed. The slickly produced documentary titled Farmlands uses Southern's tactic of throwing her into a new environment with little knowledge or research to advance a right-wing narrative. Perhaps most disturbingly, though, she uses real subjects to advance this narrative and push forward this idea of an impending race war. A full debunking of this film may be necessary at some point, but in the interest of keeping this video under an hour, I'm just going to highlight a few specific points. First off, Southern freely admits that she has no statistical proof for her claims. About the most gruesome murders imaginable, with almost no statistical proof of their existence. By that, she means there are no hard numbers for how many white farmers are being killed. But a lack of specific data doesn't always mean an absence of data, so she almost cleverly finds a different source for her information. She interviews several people from Blood Sisters Crime Scene Cleanup, an outfit that is responsible for cleaning up various crime scenes across South Africa. Southern is basing much of her claim on numbers she gets from CSC in this interview. But they don't really provide any real numbers. In fact, they will tell you that they don't have a full set of data. Between 2012 and 2016, the attacks on small holding farms or properties deemed as a farm or an area non-residential has increased by an average of 72.9%. The figures that I've just given you is, according to our statistics, uh, government statistics will differ. I don't suppose you can tell us much about why that is. <laughs> well, we don't, um, I don't work closely with them because we don't do every scene, but their, their figures are funnily enough lower than ours. 
I don't, I don't have a particular reason for that. What this answer is actually evidence of is not that farm murders are going up, but that the number of crime scenes CSC has been called into has gone up. This could mean everything from CSC's market share expanding or the number of murders actually going up. Not an open and shut statistic. It's, it's vague. If I were to hazard a guess, the reason CSC has been getting more calls is because their business has been expanding. They started their business in the mid-2000s and are currently franchising it, so more people have been operating under the CSC banner and therefore covering more crime scenes. There is also the success of the book written by the two sisters who founded the CSC, and its reception in the media might also be leading to a few new jobs. This stat needs more context. Instead, Southern says this. This was the first time on camera a qualified government associate had confirmed my worst fears. Not only are the farm murders real, the genuine numbers are much higher than we imagined. Are they though? Didn't Southern say there was no data to begin with? With almost no statistical proof of their existence. Government statistics will differ. So what are these government numbers that don't seem accurate? We're never told as the audience, but, but don't worry, I'll fill you in on this a little bit later. The questions as to why the CSC crews are getting more work are never really asked, and we're only shown a few pieces that build this race war narrative that the film is advancing. This is best revealed when the CSC reps are asked about the motivation of the murders. How on earth can you expect them to be able to credibly answer that question? These people aren't law enforcement investigating the murders. They are literally just people who wipe the blood off the floor. 90% of the increase we found is uh, due to unemployment, um, racial discrimination, and um, there's just no, there's no hope. If you don't start your own business in South Africa, where are you going to work? There's no work. Racial discrimination against who, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, I could, uh, yeah, I have to be careful. Careful? Yeah. Because I, I have to be a little bit careful. Uh, we work very closely with government. Yeah. And, uh, I spoke to Simon about it outside. Mm. Racial discrimination against people. What's suggested here, of course, is that they don't want to risk their government contract by saying racial discrimination against white people is the cause for the supposed increase in murders. This right here is a perfect example of how the film provides just enough evidence to let the audience fill in the gap. But was there more evidence here that could have been provided to give a little more context to the segment? Something that maybe would have contradicted the narrative Southern and her crew are trying to push? During this interview, we see some B-roll of Lauren Southern researching the farm murders claim. And hey, I know that website. Southern claims she found evidence that these murders were racially based from the far corners of the internet. And by this far corner, I think she means the third result to pop up when you type in South African farm murders into Google. AfricaCheck.org is a website dedicated to thoroughly examining issues in Africa, and as best I can tell, does a good job of looking at the issue of farm murders, explaining what is and is not known about them. The page Southern was looking at is an article titled Fact Sheet, Statistics on Farm Attacks and Murders in SA, SA obviously being South Africa. So does this website suggest that murders on farms in South Africa are based on race? Southern should have scrolled all the way to the bottom of the page because under the section titled, is there a political agenda behind these attacks? You can see a breakdown of the motivations of farm attacks as of 2001, where 52 attacks, or 2% of the total, were motivated by race. And keep in mind, these numbers only reflect attacks and not murders. These are the only numbers on this page that discuss race as a motivating factor, and may not even be reliable according to the 2003 National Operating Coordinating Committee. Who are they? They're the group responsible for this little bit of text here that was underneath the graph that Southern was supposedly reading. The 2003 Committee of Inquiry into Farm Attacks included that none of the statistics collected between 1991 to 2001 were completely accurate and should be viewed and interpreted with caution. Looking through the africacheck.org website, I couldn't find a single article that suggested that these crimes were motivated by race. Maybe Southern was looking somewhere else. I'd be curious to know where, and of course, journalists always cite their sources, 
which is exactly why the description box has none. But the murders are surely real, right? The website can at least confirm that. The stats on the page, which are the official government stats on murder I mentioned, were right there for Lauren Southern to check the whole time. If only she had scrolled a little bit further. The stats on the page Southern was looking at show murder rates are rather flat for farmers in South Africa, or according to police data, might be going down slightly. But more importantly, Africa Check describes the data is impossible to calculate, not just because murders may not be adequately reported, but because of how difficult it is to calculate the number of farmers in South Africa. Maybe this is what Southern meant when she said there weren't any real stats to consult? So where did she get the idea that there was a problem in the first place? It might have been useful to ask someone at crime scene cleaners how many murder scenes they clean up in a year, and not just how much it's gone up by. If the numbers were higher than what was reported by the police, you'd have some actual evidence for your claim that the government is lying about the number of murders. Imagine if someone did that though. If someone actually did some real journalism to check the claim out and see how many sites CSC covered in a year that were murders. That'd be pretty good, right? That'd be great journalism. So I did it. According to a portfolio published by CSC, on average they clean up 33 murder sites a year. That's presumably all murders, since they don't specifically state farm murders. The most recent number for annual farm deaths, according to the police of South Africa, is 74. So the government's numbers are actually over twice as high. So what did that guy say again? Between 2012 and 2016, the attacks on small holding farms or properties deemed as a farm or a area non-residential has increased by an average of 72.9%. He's not even talking about murders here. He's talking about violent attacks. So why does Lauren Southern say, Not only are the farm murders real, the genuine numbers are much higher than we imagined. It's because she's trying to twist what he says into her narrative of farmer murder rates going up. In other words, she's distorting data to push forward this idea of an impending race war. A huge portion of this film is dedicated to interviewing people in dire living conditions, or people who have lost loved ones in violent crimes. These are powerful stories, and my heart goes out to people who have to live in really terrible conditions. These anecdotes are meant to suggest the overall message of the film, that white people are being wiped out across South Africa. The stories in this film are presented in a way to push that idea forward and certain details that may contradict that narrative are conveniently left out. When a film's thesis is clearly about a supposed race war, and then it just drops an interview where a family member is crying their eyes out over the murder of a loved one, the audience is left to assume that this is another piece of evidence that a race war is on its way. Here's an example. Janine Eichenfeldt is interviewed about the murder of her father, Schlock Featherstone. She recounts the gruesome details, and understandably becomes emotional having to tell her story. Her pain is important to acknowledge, as a reminder of how a murder impacts not just the victim, but everyone around them. And as a quick preface to everything I'm about to say, I genuinely feel awful for her, and she has my deepest sympathies. I see no reason to think that she was in any way responsible for what Lauren Southern did with this interview. She is deserving of our sympathy rather than our scorn as someone who is lost someone in such a horrible way, and then had that loss exploited by a duplicitous filmmaker. The murder of Featherstone actually fits the alleged purpose of this documentary, looking at various farm murders that happened across South Africa. But does it fit Southern's narrative of black South Africans attacking white South African farm owners in an attempt to right a perceived political injustice? The actual facts surrounding this murder are not difficult to find online. A quick google of the murderer's name, Winston Boyson, gives you the result of an appeal that was made earlier this year, and that appeal, quite helpfully, includes some of the details of the murder. The first important fact not mentioned in the film is that Boyson killed two people. The first victim, Brenda Finnis, was Boyson's girlfriend at the time. A violent interaction between the two left her dead of a stab wound. The police were on the scene and attempted to arrest Boyson, but he managed to escape. He spent several days on the run and made his way to Featherstone's farm, where Boyson had worked in 2014. Boyson went there in an unsuccessful effort to convince one of his former colleagues to help him evade the police. Featherstone was unaware of his presence, but before he departed the farm, Boyson entered the house to steal a firearm. When he tried to leave, he was discovered by Featherstone, and in response, Boyson shot him. 
Featherstone attempted to make his way to a phone to call for help, and as he was doing that, Boyson shot him several more times, murdering him. Afterwards, Boyson stole some food and Featherstone's vehicle. He was later apprehended in the bush after fleeing from the vehicle when he saw some lights that he assumed were law enforcement. Those are the events according to the court document. Now I have to ask, does this sound as though Featherstone's death was the product of racial hatred? Does it sound like race had anything at all to do with the murder? Or perhaps this story was as simple as a man on the run from the law who murdered an innocent bystander. In what way does this event back up Southern's claim that white farmers are being attacked by the black majority in South Africa for their land? These details, which took seconds to find online, are omitted from the film. Even the claim that Boyson got 15 years in prison is false. He was sentenced to 15 years for the murder of Finnis, a lifetime in prison for the murder of Featherstone, and another 15 years for the theft. So the point about the government trying to protect the murderer, as subtly suggested by the film, is also not true. Of course, this appeal happened in February of 2018, and Farmlands debuted in August of 2018. And it should be noted that this interview was certainly done before February of 2018. It's possible Lauren Southern was too far in production to update the story with additional narration or captioning, but I don't personally believe this, as an update would have undercut the whole point of the film and why this interview exists within it. I also believe Southern was at least partially aware of the facts surrounding this case, and she purposely chose to omit them. Here's some additional context that was given to this interview when Southern originally published it to her YouTube channel as a teaser for the documentary in January of 2018. Janine and other families like hers have told me they are not convinced these brutal attacks are just random acts, but that the South African government may very well be complicit in allowing them to happen as they continue their political agenda to drive out white farmers and take their land. There is no evidence in the interview or any of the facts surrounding the case that this murder had anything to do with government rhetoric. So on what basis was she advancing this talking point? What evidence did she have that this murder was motivated by racial tensions? Southern removed this bit of commentary from the actual film, but the subtext remains and it makes it a more subtle and deceptive film. The message is the same, that the South African government is motivating its citizens with its rhetoric to murder white farmers. And there is evidence to suggest that Southern knew more details about this particular murder than she might let on. The original clip lets slip a crucial detail when the second victim, Brenda Finnis, is mentioned in passing. He, he's killed two people, he's destroyed two families, and he got 15 years. Why is this the only mention of a second murder victim? It makes perfect sense for Eilhelm Felt to want to focus on her father, but even she mentioned the second victim. I simply don't have enough charity in me to assume that Southern was such a poor interviewer that she had no follow-up questions about a second murder. What seems far more likely here is that she omitted the details so she could lie about the reason Featherstone was murdered. She used an innocent man's death to advance a racist narrative. After the victim exploitation, Southern goes as far as saying that segregation might be the only way to prevent a race war. On and off camera, many people, both black and white, did suggest segregation as a potential solution to this crisis. And even more worrying is the growing number of people preparing for a race-based civil war if another solution cannot be found and interviews members of Swedlanders, a group that is preparing for just that thing. And it's here where the race war narrative I kept mentioning really comes together. And obviously, it's not something you would open the film up with. It's something you have to slowly guide someone to by presenting bad stats and personal stories, anecdotes that are horribly manipulated and misrepresented to advance this narrative. So when you're finally here at the end where the race war thing comes up, you're ready to believe it because you've been primed to believe it. This bit of information is the poison pill this whole film was designed to pass to you. Southern gets a strange response from Simon Roche where he gives vague rationalizations as to why the race war is coming. This is almost certainly covering for the real reason that the Swedelanders preparations are based on prophecies from a guy's name Steiner von Rensberg. Another fact that conveniently gets left out of the film. 
instead of another digression about the many right-wing conspiracies that surround South Africa, I highly recommend this excellent video, South Africa and the Far Right, Part 1, by Rational Disconnect. He goes into the history of this race war narrative and how it's used by the Far Right to advance a specific narrative that white people and black people can't get along. He also debunks Lawrence Southard's film in about a minute, which makes me feel like I'm being really inefficient here. Ugh. This is not reporting. This is a careful distortion of facts used to advance a false dichotomy. This film is utterly convinced that the black and white populations of South Africa simply can't live together. And the reason for that lies with the anger of the black population. In one of her most recent videos, Lauren Southern declared that she would be leaving the world of YouTube to focus on making larger documentary films, like Farmlands. We can expect a highly polished production that's deeply deceptive and advances a hateful narrative, one that exploits real victims and suffering and co-ops it to fit her narrative of white people under attack by the non-white world. These documentaries are not factual or honest. Much like her earlier reporting, they are advancing a particular right-wing narrative. After I finished recording and editing most of this video, Lauren Southern announced her newest documentary film project, Borderless. And it more or less matches up exactly with what I thought it would be, specifically that narrative of white people under attack by the non-white world. Borderless once again sends her to Europe, where she'll probably conflate immigrants and refugees, include scenes where she feels like she's in danger, and feature heavily edited interviews that are anecdotes designed to make immigrants appear like evil threats. Things she probably won't touch on are stats that show the positive impact of immigrants, socially and economically, how European anti-immigrant sentiment often includes white immigrants, and that Europe is not a homogenous culture that she so cheerfully describes as the West. After she passes around the donation hat and lovers of pro-white people documentaries throw in their money, she could produce something of value that critically engages with the subject. That would even be nice to see. I mean, I like surprises, but I'm not holding my breath here.